Today we're going to check out this little beauty here. Yes, I know there are probably easier ways to deliver a rover, but I thought it was cool, so I did. What will I need it for? Well, you will have to watch until close to the end to find out. Hello everybody and welcome! Today we're going hunting! Easter egg hunting to be exact. There have been a couple of easter eggs in the original Kerbal Space Program and now there appear to be new ones within Kerbal Space Program 2, which was recently released as an early access title. With many problems, unfortunately. I know some in the community just want to see the things, others want to find them for themselves. So here is how I'm going to go about this. There will be multiple missions in this video and there are going to be parts of those that will be completely spoiler free. Then there will be a minor spoiler alert as soon as the location of the easter egg or anomaly as they were called in case p1 is revealed. Basically as soon as I adjust my orbit in such a way that you can see where I will come down there will be a spoiler alert before that. And then there will be a major spoiler alert before I reveal what I find at those locations. I'll mark the chapters accordingly so you can jump to each segment to skip the spoiler parts and enjoy the rest of the fun because there's a lot of stuff to see. Let's start with the mum. I'm not going to add a spoiler alert here because what you can find in the mum are exactly the same easter eggs you can find in KSP1. So I regard those as common knowledge by now. Also, I have already revealed the newly exposed Monarch with the map of the Kerbal system in last week's video, so this is just a quick recap of that. This particular arch can be found on the east end of this crater basin. As soon as you are 30 kilometers away from it, it will pop into sight. This is true for all of the anomalies, so if you orbit 20 to 30 kilometers above ground, you will be able to find the other things I'm showing in this video. Alright, that's the man done, so let's move on. And what we have here is an exercise in futility, so I will go rather quickly about this. Since the game is a bit unstable at the moment, to put it mildly, I opted for a simpler style of engineering. Simple capsule, single stack, just go. And our target is Bob, a moon of the gas giant Jewel, far out into the solar system. My goal here was to find the dead baby Kraken that was in the original game. Mostly I wanted some visuals of it to include in my videos when I talk about bugs or random destruction of my vehicles, but I wasn't able to find it. Yeah, it seems like they have either decided to remove that particular easter egg or they will add it in later. We'll see about that, the game is still early access after all. What I did find was an eerie green glow on the surface of Bob. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe this is sunlight reflecting off of Joule and due to the planet's green hue, the light reflected is also green. While me flying around Bob was a bit futile, the scenery was rather nice to watch most of the times. And then I tried to land in the center of the large crater and this happened. I dropped right through the surface and then towards the moon's core and then since gravity focuses on a singular point there, I was accelerated to ludicrous speeds right out of the solar system. <laughs> and here I thought the interstellar features would only come later in early access. Guess I already found a secret mass relay. Anyway, so Bob was a bust. On to the next target. This time we're going to hit a bit closer to home. Minmus. Again, I have opted for a rather small vehicle to give the Kraken not much opportunity to mess with it. Let's see how that goes. And we're off. This time I chose a white and orange livery. Yeah, that paint system in KSP2 is fun to mess about with and you can give each of your vehicles a nice little individual touch. In here we have the smaller vehicle I talked about and then we're off. All right, simple circularization around the Kerbin and then it's time to, well, find a uh, find Minmus and get an encounter with it. Well, finding it is rather easy if you are a little bit familiar with your surroundings of this planet. 
So basically, after I set my target, what I usually try to do with Minmus is start my burn from one of the ascending or descending nodes, because one of them will, in one or two orbits, uh, yield an encounter with Minmus most of the times. Here I'm just trying to tweak it and not crash into the moon or leave the Kerbin system because luckily or unfortunately I had a moon encounter here as well or moon encounter or whatever. Ah, I'm not used to the new naming. Anyway, so we're boosting away from our planet and we're heading towards Minmus. And due to the inadequacies of the current implementation of the orbital lines and maneuver system, I need to fine tune it on the way. So that's what we're doing here, and then we're at Minmus, and yeah, since I wasn't able to find unit in advance, I now have to use way more fuel and get the periapsis down. But it's possible by using the radial in button to burn, and it gets a lot quicker when you increase the thrust, because I had to decrease that earlier to fine tune the orbit, because that engine was too powerful to do really fine maneuvers. That was actually, by the way, a nice uh, example of where the part manager can be useful because I was able to uh, use it in the map view, which is not possible in KSP1. And attention, minor spoilers, you're going to see where I'm going to land on Minmus. Now that we're burning here uh, a little bit more to the, uh, to the north, I'm going to go in that crater below my orbit. You see where my mouse is? That's where we want to go, that's where the anomaly on Minmus is. So if you want to go visit it, you can take a screenshot or record this video or whatever you want to do and then go there. So yeah, <laughs> I ran into this little bug uh, a lot of times in this video, sorry, in this mission. And basically what it does... Oh yeah, Major Sparless, careful, now we're going to see what, uh, what happens. But uh, let me finish the explanation of that bug. Basically, you're in time warp, you exit time warp, and then your vehicle starts spinning like crazy. Not really pleasant. What we see here, down there, is some weird type of monument or some something. It's definitely something. So let's cancel our orbital velocity to almost zero and then burn towards it and then, of course, brake. What I'm trying to do in this case, which is really easy on Minmus because of the low gravity, is to cancel out my velocity above my target and then just drop down there and, and burn uh, retrograde all the way down, if necessary, because yeah, it takes a lot of time on Minmus because the gravity is so low. So it's, as I mentioned, easier and you're not as likely to crash as on, for instance, Tylo, which we will see later, by the way. Almost there now and yeah, this is going to be an unpleasant theme of this video because what we want to look at is in the shade, since the sun is not up yet, even though it's shining through the mountains, which is another bug. So I waited a little bit to get this thing better into view and, well, this is something. This is actually the first time I saw it myself because I try to avoid spoilers. So that's why I also try to avoid spoilers for you guys. Alrighty then. So let's get a closer look with our Kerbal. And what is this? This is a kind of statue with... Well, it's definitely not a Kerbal. It's a creature with some tentacles for mouths, but it's like smaller tentacles looking upwards it has a big crown with some big crystal on there what else can we see well it's kind of welcoming uh, kind of praying to the stars or something we also see two circles on the ground and of course all of these spheres all around but what is most important at least to our Kerbal here is well that's what Kerbals do every time they discover something new Plant a flag, of course, and of course have a meaningful description for this finger. <laughs> I assume it's a finger because it looks like a finger. And Kerbals also have... do they have fingers? I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah, so that's it. And I tried to forward time to see whether or not this kind of like a sundial type thing or like a calendar. 
maybe if the shadows line up with some of the circles, then there could be some hint there to be gained, but at least I didn't find out anything in regards to that. So, off to the next target. Well, not this time. So, again! Yes, we're going to try it again. And yeah, my target this time is Tylo. So we need a lot of a beefier vehicle because Tylo is really hard to land on and also hard to get back off from. But we're not going to do the back, getting back off from part. And definitely not with this iteration of the launch. Again. We lost too much Delta V, uh, the previous attempt, so yeah, but this worked fine. We have a nice clean booster separation. And then we're moving on and out of the atmosphere where we can finally ditch our fairing and look at the lander. And here we have already our jewel encounter. And lo and behold, there is an orbital line here. This was surprising because in the current version of Kerbal Space Program, the early access version, uh, this is usually not present because it's a bug. But I didn't realize how much I had missed that already uh, until I, I, I saw this finally. But then it was gone once I exited Kerbin's sphere of influence. I really hope they fix that soon. The patch is on the way. Maybe it's already out by the time you see this video. I don't know. All right, we are at Tylo and we're going close in to get our uh, circularization burn. Almost ready to start it. Huh. That's not good. Again. Yeah, I have no idea what happened there. Basically, we just crashed into something invisible. I don't know. But after reloading and trying it again, it worked without a problem. Unfortunately, that uh, orbit was a lot to be, has a lot to be desired because it was way too inclined. So, yeah, I tried to get it really flat to have a nice equatorial orbit going on. This is what we're doing here and we have succeeded. Before we move on, we have to add another spoiler warning. And it's a minor spoiler, because now you're going to see where I'm going to land. And it's going to be here. This little uh, white, well it's not really white, but it's a little bit brighter, this crater. And it's right on the orbital, well, equatorial path. So this is going to be a lot easier to land on. Alright, ditching our transfer stage, where we used up the final fuel. Speaking of using fuel, uh, there's kind of a fuel transfer bug, or at least with this vehicle, where even though I had the fuel lines, the fuel would not transfer from the bottom tank to the top tanks. Yeah, so I had to use the resource manager to do that until I was able to ditch that tank. And then I realized the lander looks a little bit like a space bunny, <laughs> but that bunny wouldn't hop because it refused to extend its legs. So, yeah, what should I do? Land on the rover? Nah, that, that's not going to work, right? So, my decision was to try to drop the rover and land the lander somewhere else, or just not crash it on top of the rover. And yes, the rover is safe, and so is the pilot. Well, we never planned to return with this vehicle anyway, so... Yeah, let's, let's use the rover to drive where we want it to go, because we're really far away. And yeah, we're not going anywhere with this thing, because for some reason it refused to engage the motors. Hmm. Could be that the couple are hanging around both of their necks that was still there for some reason. But yeah, I decided it was, it was not worth it. Again. So... Yep, we are trying this again. And this time I started the, the retrograde burn a lot earlier. And yes, this results in a major spoiler now, because now you're going to see what I'm going to find in that crater. So you see it in the middle above my lander already. There's like this little line that's getting bigger and it's surrounded by some rocks. Hmm, what could that be or what is that? 
Well, some people have already spoiled it in other videos without warning, which I didn't find very nice, but yeah. Ooh! Well, that landing was worse than the first one, but the rover, well, it has still his, its wheels attached and its battery, so let's try to drive it. Let's see what happens this time. So, Bill has to get back to Bob. Uh, Bob, not Bob. We already were at Bob. And... Yes, this is working! Nice! So let's head over there to that statue. And on the way I encountered a surface kraken of some kind, so basically the rover was undrivable. So I decided to not drive it, but kind of do the armadillo or whatever you want to call it. I just rolled <laughs> using the reaction wheel. Good thing that didn't explode. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the jittering of the wheels didn't make it easier, but in the end I managed to get closer. <laughs> and at one point uh, I hit a good surface patch again, so that was that was something nice. All right, let's roll over and roll over. And finally, we are on a safe patch of surface. And then we are at our target in the shadow of that giant statue. And again, what we really want to look at is not uh, in direct sunlight. So we only see it illuminated from behind, which is something we fortunately can change with a little bit of time warp. So let's have a closer look at this thing. Well, it looks different than the other one. For instance, the eyes are slits and not have round pupils. Um, the proportions are different and those mouth tentacles also look different than from the other one. And it appears to be holding a binary star system. I don't know. We will talk about what this could potentially mean later, but first let's uh, get to the final uh, target of this video. Um, but not like this. <laughs> this rocket is toast. Again! Yes, so I completely redesigned this thing um, because I thought, okay, if things turn out to be that wobbly, I'm going to use like the, the ah, I forgot what it's called, but basically you have the, 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 the th you pull your payload instead of pushing it. So that's what I'm doing here. I used that method in case P1 as well for a large and unwieldy payload b way before fairings were a thing. What also was a thing in this one was that I had incredible lag. And you might notice some weird graphical glitches on with the shadows that are going on. Basically, I was playing this at 1 FPS or less, and it was due to this graphical glitch, which I didn't notice until later when I quit the game and restarted, and then everything was a lot smoother. So, yeah, I suffered through an hour of basically unnecessary lag and because I didn't restart the game. Anyway, we are going to Duna without orbital lines this time, but um, yeah, I have a bit of experience now with flying blind in KSP2. So let's get there. And here we are now adjusting our orbits uh, to get close to the planet and not crash into it. And there we go, after retracting the solar. Now you can see the flickering of the shadows really well. And we are now getting into the stable orbit yes and once again careful minor spoilers ahead because we are going to now see where i want to land the target is near the north ice cap or north pole and it's in a crater that has some kind of tip in the middle or like a little a little mini mountain inside. I'm sure there is a geological term for that and that looked really cool, the engine illuminating the drop tanks. Now you can see it, uh, where my mouse clicked, there is our target. There's a crater and in the middle of the crater is some, some kind of elevation where our target is going to be. 
So, now using the last of the fuel in our transfer stage to really get the, the orbital velocity cancelled as much as I could. And in order to do that, I had a probe core on the transfer stage. This resulted in a bit of a problem, because I used that for control to have it line up nice with the engine. And when I separated, uh, control stayed with that transfer stage, and the game refused to switch to my lander, which kind of resulted in a little bit of panic for me, as you can see here. <laughs> a lot of messages. But fortunately, if you double-click on another vessel in, um, in vicinity, it will switch to that vessel. In case B1, it would not switch to that vessel, it would target that vessel. Uh, this time it switched to that vessel. Um, personally, usually I would prefer the double-click targets uh, the other vessel, but in this case it was actually saving my butt from crashing, or saving those two Kerbal's butts, if you're being honest. A, bit, a little bit of tumbling, a little bit of, of, of faffing about with trying to get that reoriented. It was a bit of stressful if you watched the ground altitude indicator, because we're already rather low for this type of maneuver. But it sure looks pretty, doesn't it? And if you turn up the music for Duna, that's a really excellent piece of audio that you need to listen to. It's, it's really well done. And we also, speaking of well done, ha, uh, I managed to finally get this thing into a stable configuration, even though it's kind of corrupted because one of the nose cones on the right, if you see, is tilted upside because, I don't know, the game did something in the VAB that I didn't notice. Yeah, as I said, a lot of bugs. A lot of bugs in KSP2, unfortunately. Also a lot of bugs with this landing gear, but fortunately not this time around, because otherwise I would have been really annoyed. Because I, I, this landing didn't go as well as I intended, you'll see later what I mean. So I then tried it after I completed everything, I reloaded and tried it again, and it failed all the time. The landing gear dropped off, things exploded. Anyway, here is the landing now. And once again, we are somewhere in the shadows. <laughs> because the sun is not up yet, and that's resulted in me not seeing where I'm really at. And yeah, engaging too much, thru too much thrust when I in reality shouldn't. Now this bug is on its back. Yeah, not a good look. But maybe we can salvage the rover, I thought. And... <laughs> Well, it actually worked. This time a bug helped me because the rover wheels digging into the surface and resulting in massive additional um, impulse that, uh, that actually helped me this time to spin it around. And look at Ike in the background. Isn't this nice? Well, now we have some major spoilers, really major spoilers ahead, because what I find here is very interesting in regards to Kerbal lore. But before, we need to drive there, don't we? I run into the same problem as with the lander, because I can't see anything, because those headlights are really... well, they don't light up anything really well. So I didn't see that big drop there, and I lost both my solar panels and the antenna in the back, which the antenna was basically more decorative. And the solar panels are not really useful, because for some reason the game doesn't drain electricity at the moment. Which is fine for me in a case like this. What's not as fine is that I believe the rover wheels, especially these larger ones here, they struggle a lot with uh, like little hills and mountains like this. I mean, look at how hard this thing is trying to get up that hill. And it's not even that steep. So mm, I think there is some tweaking that needs to be done to those wheels. Anyway, while we have a nice sunrise over Duna, we move to 
Well, what exactly is it? <laughs> I haven't seen that before either. So this was this was also the first time I saw that in um, while while I recorded this video, and it looks rather fascinating. And we are going to have a better look at it later once I get this rover to a halt. Yeah, let's just bump into that. <laughs> Why not? Okay, son, do your thing so we can have that finally in, uh, well, a little bit better illumination. And here it is. Well, what is it? It has tentacles and some, some figures coming out of its head and a really big branch in the middle that goes to somewhere. I'll talk about that later in the video when we when we have a little bit more time about that. But you see here there's like four side branches and one uh, is completely lost. One is a figure shows that a figure there is lost. Then we have some two uh, two other creatures up there and we're going to have a better look with our crew member here. Hi there. Let's get over there and use your jetpack or. EVA pack to have a better look at what we're dealing with. I think this one on the right is definitely a Kerbal. I mean, look at it. Those big head and eyes, those that, that nice little facial gesture. Look at the resemblance. Separated at birth. Maybe. I don't know. Are Kerbals birth? Are they grown? Do they just appear? We will see. And over there we have something that looks like that creature from the, the people call it the wizard on Minmus. Um, I call it more like a priest, but yeah, you do you. And then we have some weird markings on that crown. So there is some type of alien language involved. Whatever it means, I don't know, somebody will surely decipher that. And yeah, this could be like the Kraken God that spawned everything in the universe. Who knows? What I do know is that Kerbals need to plant flags on the broken torso of a former species. <laughs> But yeah, let's let's not uh, not be too macabre here, and get back to the rover, because we're done here. We have found what we came looking for, and we have no means of getting back, at least not at the moment. Not until the game is less buggy and they can do some more reliable missions. And yeah, let's have one final look at this thing here because it's really fascinating. And then we're going to have to discuss what this all means, if it means anything. Let's try to collect everything we've seen and see what we can distill out of it. The anomaly on Minmus, to me, appears to depict a Kerbin-centric universe view. The figure in the middle represents Kerbin, then the larger and smaller circle represent Mun and Minmus, the two moons of Kerbin. The six spheres on the outside are the other planets, Moho, Eve, Duna, Jewel and Elu. Notice that the eyes of the statue are pointed upwards and also the gigantic crystal in its crown is almost shaped like it is pointing to the stars. It could symbolize that before there were Kerbals, there was a race of tentacle mouth creatures that went to the stars. I don't know, what do you think? Let me know in the comments or let's discuss it on my Discord server. But if you do so, please make sure to use the spoiler feature. Let's not spoil the fun for all of those who still want to discover this for themselves. The Arch in the Moon is clearly a map of the Kerbal system with all seven planets and their respective moons neatly lined up. We know there are two additional arches that are still covered in regolith and we also know that the developers plan to release two new star systems for the final version of KSP2 to explore with interstellar travel. My guess is that the other arches will reveal maps for those other systems as soon as they are ready and inside the game. The statue on Tylo is a bit of a conundrum for me. I don't think it's supposed to be the same species we saw on the statue on Minmus. The eyes are slits and don't have round pupils and the tentacle mouth is much more pronounced. 
Given Tylo's gravity, I'm impressed that whoever built this managed to pile those gigantic boulders on top of each other and then a statue on it. It appears to hold two stars, one in each hand. Maybe this is symbolic for a binary star system? Or travel between two star systems? Like we came from there, we went from there? I don't know. Or maybe this is not a representation of the species, but some kind of deity holding the universe in balance. Or at least the binary star system this symbolizes. I'm not certain, but the thing on top of its head could be a planet and a rocket launching from that. Or it's just some decorative headgear. What do you think? Again, leave a comment. And now we come to the final piece, probably the most interesting in my opinion. We have something that I would like to call the Kraken God carrying the universe on and four branches coming off of it. One is clearly a Kerbal, the other seems to represent the tentacle mouth species that is also depicted on Minmus. And I believe that species is also shown in the picture that came out of the something more hidden audio track messages from the feature videos the developers released over the past one and two years. The other two branches are unknown because the monument has already eroded too far. All seem to look up to that central branch. Maybe a map where they want to go one day? Or maybe the big planet or star in the center symbolizes the origin of the same kind of progenitor species, which is the big head at the bottom, which shares some similarities with the Tylo statue, especially the slit eyes and larger tentacle face. I have no idea how to interpret the symbols on the crown. Maybe somebody has an idea in the comments. So that's it for my Easter egg hunt. So far. I know there's some interesting landmarks to discover still, but I wouldn't put those in the same category as these monuments. And I also believe that the developers will add more of these interesting pieces to discover the more the game progresses. Whenever that will be. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.